I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. Tonight we're leading off with politics. Three of Portland's current city council members think they would be a fantastic new mayor for the city. We've heard from Renee Gonzalez and Mingus Maps, and so tonight we're going to hear from Carmen Rubio. That's our big story tonight. Carmen Rubio was born and raised in Hillsborough, the granddaughter of immigrants who came to this country as migrant workers. She's the first in her family to graduate from college and later became the first Latina on the Portland City Council. Her background includes a decade of leading the Latino network and then time working as a policy advisor inside Portland City Hall. She was elected to the City Council in 2020. Our Blair Best has wanted to hear from all of the candidates and now from her on what's her plan on dealing with our homeless crisis. It is improving, but we still have our work cut out for us. Portland City Commissioner and mayoral candidate Carmen Rubio believes the city should take on more responsibility when it comes to addressing homelessness. We need to step up and step in and roll up our sleeves and finally piece together like a true system that works. What about this current system in your eyes is not working? The current system in my, you know, in my opinion is not a system. I feel like we have um, a collection of really great programs and efforts, but it's not knitted together in a seamless system across all jurisdictions. For a long time, the county has been doing the problems and, and going at it. We've had a piece of it, but not really in a way that is at a high level systemic. And I believe that um, what the situation calls for now, what the landscape is now, we need to all, we all need to assume responsibility for this issue. And that's where I feel it's really necessary for the city as leaders, we need to lean in, not retract right now. Because the city can only do so much when Correct. it comes to homelessness. They have to rely on the county and, and the state yes. for a lot. How would you approach the relationship with the county? So the county relationship is, Critical. We're interdependent. Whether uh, people want us to be or not, that that is how it's structured. So we have a responsibility to make it work. I completely reject the premise that we can take our toys and go home. We can't do that. We're leaders. We're elected to serve the public, and the public counts on us to work it out and to figure it out. That's our job. So we need to stay at the table and keep staying at the table until we work through these intractable problems, but together. If elected, would you continue to have the city fund the county's joint office of homeless services? Absolutely. And, and the reason I say that is because we do not have the ability to, like I said, take our toys and go home. We have to actually figure this out. And, and that, those funds are our lever and our leverage to making sure that we're good partners. Um, that together with trust and leadership. Do you feel like the county's been using those funds appropriately? I feel like the county is starting to be more open um, and more responsive, not only just to the city, but also to the public demand. So in that respect, um, we still have more work to be negotiated, but it is moving in a good direction. If elected, will people still be sleeping on the sidewalks? Probably. I mean, this is not something that's going to be solved at all overnight. Um, it took us decades to get into a situation where we're in a crisis. Um, it will take us a long time to get out. But my hope is for a functioning system that we have the on-ramps for people to find the supports that they need should they, should they want to, that we have a system that's functioning and it's there and ready to receive them. I believe in shelters. I believe that we need to deal with the immediacy of the urgency on the street right now. That hasn't been a practice um, consistently in other places. And how will you handle the people who choose not to go into shelter? You know, that is a, a more challenging thing. You know, we have, uh, obviously, we have choice. Um, my role is to make sure that whatever we do, you know, that it is done centered in our Portland values. So it's like done with accountability and also compassion. So that's the lens that I would bring. What does that look like on the streets? Accountability and compassion. I think it means like, you know, we have the role of making sure and enforcing that the rights of way are accessible to everybody. And so, um, that's one way that, it, that, that we have to be ready to, to use uh, the levers that we have, but we can do so without it being a hammer. And outreach workers is a really critical piece in Absolutely. all of this. And currently yeah. the city employs six. Do you think that's enough to handle the crisis we're seeing? I absolutely believe we have completely underfunded Portland Street Response. And I am one of those uh, folks who really sees the value 
um, of Portland Street Response being the connective tissue of the work and the, the clear uh, roles of the city and the clear roles of the county. That's the group responding to those experiencing a nonviolent mental or behavioral health crisis. We need to co clearly commit to it at the top and uh, give it the capacity it needs to uh, stand on its own and demonstrate what it can do and also be available to and accessible to all four corners of the city. So do you see that outreach workers need to have more of a presence on our streets as opposed to law enforcement? I believe that we need both. I think that it's not an either or um, situation for me. I, I do believe that we can do multiple approaches at the same time because everybody's situation is different and every incident is very different. But I do believe in outreach workers as well um, with clear um, goals and a clear understanding of what their role and their work is. What do you have to say to voters who have just completely lost faith in our local government's ability to handle this crisis? I say that I hear you and I see you and I, um, I understand the frustration. I hear it every single day. I hear it um, in businesses that I go talk to, in community, neighborhoods, my own neighborhood, um, and my own family even, you know, frustrations um, expressed about it. And I will say that, that you are right. We have not had a system that is, that is functional and it is meeting the moment. And uh, that's where our work is. It's, it's unprecedented, yes. We could not have expected it post COVID, yes. Um, but is it still our responsibility to stay at the table? Yes, it is. Well, there's with me now. That was really interesting because it was not a short interview, but I have to say I was surprised at how little she had to say. Yeah, she didn't have many concrete plans on how she would address homelessness, but I will say I've interviewed her a handful of times and she's always been careful in the way that she chooses her words. And I feel as if she's always been maybe a little hesitant to take any bold stance on something as big as, say, the homeless crisis. And with this series of reports, you've, you've interviewed the other major leading candidates and they all have specific steps that they're going to take. They do, whether they're realistic or not, they all had some sort Fair. of a specific plan of what they would do, cut homelessness in half, get everyone off the streets. And what she had more was of how she plans to approach this crisis, approach the relationship with the county and her fellow commissioners. Interesting. That's and what I, I gathered. Yeah. Well, and as I was paying attention, you asked her about the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Did mm -hmm. she approve of what they're doing now? She didn't answer that. What about people who are homeless and won't go to shelters? She didn't answer that. Mm -hmm. What about people who are fed up with the system that she's a big part of mm -hmm. and is not working? She really didn't have an answer for that either. Yeah, and those are all really big questions, really big topics. I'm not sure she has all the answers right at this moment. But like I said, she was careful. She was careful with how she answered those because I think she knows how controversial those topics are. Right, and it's hard to thread the needle and make everybody happy. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, I appreciate you doing these really because you give us a little slice. It's much better than like a 30 second soundbite or even mm -hmm. a 15 second soundbite. So thanks for interviewing all these top candidates. I think it's very helpful. Yeah, me too. Now, it's your turn. What's going through your mind after hearing from Commissioner Rubio? Send us your thoughts, will you? You could email us. The address is the story at kgw.com or call and leave a voicemail, 503-226-5090. And if you missed any of Blair's one-on-one -on -one interviews with the top mayoral candidates, you can find them right now on KGW+. Plus. That's our free streaming app that you can find on Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire. Just search KGW and then download it to your home screen so that you can catch up on the story whenever you miss an episode. Now, you may have heard about the state court battle in Oregon in which a woman who wants to be a foster mom sued after the state said she had to agree to support things like gender affirming care if a child in her care wanted it and qualified for it. And she said that's just too much. The state said, well, then you cannot be a foster parent. So now in Washington state, a couple with similar feelings filed a federal lawsuit against the state for similar reasons. They claim Washington is violating their rights, disqualifying people not only from fostering gay or transgender youth, but any child. Shane and Jennifer DeGrosse are represented by the Alliance for Defending Freedom. The group says the couple served as foster parents for more than nine years until August of 2022. In June of that year, Washington's Department of Children, Youth and Families enacted new regulations they required, among other things, all foster parents use a foster child's preferred pronouns and chosen name. The couple says they would love and support any child, but that they would not say or do anything that violates their religious beliefs. Because of that, their application was rejected. Their lawsuit claims these new rules violate their First Amendment rights, and they might have a bit of a legal precedent there. 
A 2020 federal lawsuit, also out of Washington, Blias v. Hunter, ended with the court ruling that the department must not discriminate against foster care applicants based on their beliefs. The DeGrosse lawsuit claims after that ruling, the state discounted its previous transgender policy and replaced it with the new regulations that are, quote, substantially similar. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this story might also sound similar because of a case here in Oregon. This case involves Jessica Bates. She sued the state last year after her foster application was rejected when she said she would not support LGBTQ plus children in all the ways the state requires. In November, a judge ruled against her, saying her views on gender identity could cause harm, even if it's not her intent. She has appealed, so this case is not over yet. A final ruling is set for October of this year. Now, these cases appear to center around an applicant's religious beliefs clashing with what a state requires of them as a foster parent. But we heard from a local couple who balances their beliefs with the state requirements. Jeremy and Christina Tom are a Beaverton couple, heavily involved with Hope City Church in Milwaukee. They say despite having more traditional Christian views of sexuality and gender, Oregon's foster requirements have not been an issue. For us, it hasn't been so much about sharing our faith verbally with the kids who come into the house as much as it is about just seeing love in action. I don't think I need to speak a lot of words. I don't think I have to pound Bible verses over and over into everyone that walks into my home. This debate has spread nationwide. The federal government has proposed rules that would require anyone who wants to be a foster parent to support LGBTQ kids in their care. Conservative lawmakers, attorneys general, and other groups have pushed back against the proposed rules, saying that would put Christian families out of the foster care system. And they say rural areas in particular depend on faith-based agencies and families to provide foster care. Research from the University of Tennessee suggests that Christians are three times more likely to consider fostering than others, and twice as likely to adopt. And it's no secret that both Oregon and Washington have struggled with finding housing placement for foster kids, including having to put them in hotels or even offices. We'll continue to follow each of these lawsuits, as well as the federal proposal, to see what the future of fostering could look like here at home and around the country. Coming up next on The Story, we have the results from a heat mapping study of the Portland metro area. Researchers are studying neighborhoods to see which ones heat up faster and stay hot longer. They want to know why it happens so they can counter it, what they've learned and how it can be used to help in the future when the story returns.
We're living in a world that's heating up, and we know we're not immune to it here in the Northwest. How many of you have air conditioners in your home now when you really didn't need them in the 80s and definitely not even when I moved here in the early 90s? Researchers and leaders are starting to take a close look at hot spots in our communities and what we can do about it. Multnomah, Washington and Clackamas counties teamed up along with more than 100 volunteers to map areas of the metro. Volunteers attached equipment to their cars and then all drove around a predetermined route three times on a single day last July. They collected 269,000 temperature readings from the ground as they drove. Um, and we drove around on the hot day and even just sitting in our cars from the morning to the final shift of mapping, we noticed how hot it was. Um, so it was really great to see that that data would be tracked in real time and used for something in the future. With the data, researchers were able to put together a heat map of the area and see which places are hotter than others at the same time of day. Let's see if this surprised you. Here's the morning map. The blue areas are less than 60 degrees and yellow and light orange are right around 60 degrees. The orange areas are 61 to 63. You can see in the morning, Northeast Portland was much warmer than the rest of the area. By the afternoon, we'd warmed up to the mid 80s, but you can see there's some pockets where it's much cooler. Northwest Portland, where Forest Park is, did not get out of the 70s on that day. And in general, the west side of Portland was cooler than the east side. And by the evening, the west side had cooled off much faster than the east side. Northeast Portland and the area along I-205 held on to the temperature of 85 to 87 degrees. The researchers can zoom into the map and see how the heat affects specific neighborhoods as well, which is kind of cool. And they can take a look at what's in those neighborhoods that's contributing to the way they hold on to heat. Now, the west side of Portland has, wait for it, a lot more trees. And the researchers say that really does help keep it a lot cooler there. And they say the areas that took longer to cool off had lower buildings and a lot more pavement. Sort of makes sense. It's called the urban heat island effect. And if you think about stuff like concrete, the bricks that are that are in our part of our hardscape, part of our built environment, those retain heat during the day and they radiate it out at night. And so that's the, the phenomenon that we were able to map here. Pretty interesting. Overall, they found a 17 degree difference between the hottest and the coolest areas recorded. The overall high temperature that day was 92 degrees. But in the afternoon reading, some areas recorded 94 degrees and others only 77. So what do we do with this information? Well, the researchers say it'll go toward planning things in the short term, like where to locate cooling shelters on hot days, and it'll help healthcare workers do outreach to vulnerable people who live in the hotter areas. Over the long term, it'll inform decisions like tree planting, pavement removal, and building codes. Moving on. Last week, we brought you a big story about artificial intelligence and how powerful it can be creating and manipulating images, videos, even voices. Our expert was a man named Al Tompkins. He teaches journalists how to spot fakes all over the world. We wanted to share an email we got from a viewer who used her knowledge to spot a fake on Facebook. Patricia in Scapoose wrote to us, I learned from that show and now look very carefully at pictures and articles. I occasionally see posts that appear to pull at heartstrings to encourage a click on the photo, link, or response to the post. This photo was absolutely everything Mr. Tompkins said we should look at to decide if it's a deep fake. He said hands and fingers usually are a giveaway, and this photo takes the cake. All right, this is the photo she's talking about. Can you see any problems? This was, it actually does have many of the red flags we told you about. Obviously, there's a straight baby arm there. That's kind of a giveaway. There are others too. Many of the fingers in the photo don't exactly look right. And the patches on the man's uniform, they don't have actual names or words on them. And by the way, his skin on his face and forehead, well, that'd make a supermodel jealous. It's a big old fake. Thanks to Patricia for sending this in to help others learn as well. And while AI on social media could certainly be harmful by getting you to click on links that could lead to malware or things that, like that, how do you feel about AI being used in a murder trial? Probably not great, and a judge in Washington state agrees. In a first of its kind ruling across the country, that judge refused to allow AI enhanced video as evidence in a triple homicide trial. The case stems from a 2021 shooting outside of a sports bar in King County that killed three people and hurt three others. 
Court documents say a 10 second Snapchat video that showed the shooting was put through an AI tool because the previous edits made forensic analysis impossible. But the judge threw the whole thing out. Cornelius Hawker from our sister station in Seattle spoke to a UW expert who says this will not be the last test the court system faces from artificial intelligence. State judges are getting help to better understand artificial intelligence from UW law professor Ryan Kalo. What are some of the issues and problems they might encounter around it? And perhaps how to address those problems. It doesn't surprise him a judge refused to allow AI enhanced video to be used in a triple homicide trial. You, you can't use a process like this and feel comfortable that what is being represented is necessarily what actually happened. Court documents reveal the original video was low resolution and contained substantial motion blur. After the video was ran through an AI tool, a witness for the state, who was a longtime videographer, said approximately 16 times the number of pixels were added using an algorithm and enhancement method unknown to and unreviewed by any forensic video expert. We need to be concerned about the use of AI in the investigative stage. We need to be concerned about its use uh, you know, in, in trial as evidence. Um, and we need to be concerned about its use um, you know, by litigants or judges um, to make decisions. Because of the way artificial intelligence can be used, Kalo thinks it's going to take a while for judges to feel comfortable allowing AI enhanced video to be used in court cases. I think it's gonna take more comfort on the part of the judiciary with the technology itself. And they wanna feel like their audience or the audience of the technology, the jury is sophisticated to enough to understand that this is guesswork. Super interesting. In a statement, by the way, the company that created the AI tool, Topaz Labs, said it strongly recommends against using its AI technology for forensic or legal applications. So there's that. Coming up next on the story, today's eclipse was the big national headline. So as we went digging for old today, we wanted something related to the lunar event. But instead, we found a variety of things from the 1700s to today. So what do they have to do with the moon? Well, you'll get all the details when the story returns.
Ah, yes, it's that time again. Today's eclipse grabbed the attention of the country, wowing audiences from Texas to Maine. We only had a partial eclipse here at home, but we enjoyed the crowds in 2017 for the last total eclipse. That was awesome. And that got us thinking about today's Digging for Old. When we searched the Oregon Historical Society's online archive for eclipse, we only got a few results that didn't really grab our attention. And they have a little bit of everything there. So, you know, we were kind of surprised by that. But when we searched for moon, OK, now we're in business. We got a few dozen results. Let's run through a few of the odd things that we found at the Historical Society stashed away for good reason or maybe not. We'll start with this. Any guess what this is? This is a two piece copper moonshine still moonshine. That's why it popped up when we searched moon. This comes from the Prohibition era around 1925 and was down in Marion County along the Pudden River. The Historical Society got this from the Mission Mill Museum on behalf of an anonymous donor in the early 1970s. Now here's a blast from the past that history buffs may recognize. This one from way back in the 1770. This is called a spontoon and it came from an area between modern day Germany and Denmark. It has a crescent moon underneath the blade. It was donated to the battleship Oregon Museum in 1926. And when the museum dissolved, all of its items, including this spontoon, ended up with the Historical Society in 1959. And, you know, when we say the Historical Society has a little of everything, we're not kidding you. This is a plastic toilet seat cover dispenser. I'm sure it's seen lots of moons in its day, but that's not exactly what we were looking for. But anyway, as long as we're here, it was donated last year by a founding member, bassist and vocalist of the Oregon based rock band Dead Moon. They played from the late 80s to 2006 and formed here in Portland. According to their website, their music combined dark and lovelorn themes with punk and country music influences. A fan gave this to the band at one of their shows and they passed it along to the Historical Society. Good for you. <laughs> That's the end of our show. Thanks so much for watching and remember the story that never ends. Straight Talk with Laurel Porter's coming your way next. I'll see you right back here tomorrow night at 630.